on the issue of journals, I mean, I know there's a big drive. I know that um, the univer Harvard University is canceling subscriptions. Uh, a number of universities in Europe can't afford it anymore. Uh, Entire magazine ran an article about alternatives. But the question will remain, who is the driver for these journals? And it's academic institutions that's looking to get the, the publications in prestigious journals, mm -hmm. because that is like the currency. Mm -hmm. How would the open access affect you know, what is deemed as um, academic currency? It's a very, very good question. Um, if you rewind the scene five or 10 years, essentially what you have is the impact, high impact and prestigious journals all being closed access and for pay. And what open access journals existed were rather low impact and low prestige. And so five or 10 years ago, it was a very impossible um, proposition. Now what's happening is you have major journals arising that are fundamentally open access. So the PLOS series, the BMC series, uh, there are some very important journals now that are open access. So now, let's say in the last five years, scientists have the option to choose. And my argument would be that that choice, that, that consideration should be one part of our choice. You know, we think about, uh, does this journal permit publication of color figures? Does this journal have length limits that I'm going to find restrictive? Well, we also ought to be thinking about what are this journal's access constraints. Um, now, probably any of us around the table has the opportunity to publish something in science. We'll do it. But meat and potatoes, day to day, what we should be doing is when we have the possibility of choosing an open access journal over a closed access journal, we do that. The journals, the scientific publishers, saw an opportunity. They came into a community, if you think back, at least to be the beginning of my career, most of the journals in my field were non-commercial, and they were society publications, okay? And one by one, those society publications have been bought up by commercial interests. Some of them relatively right-minded, like University of California Press, I gave you that example. And some of them very wrong-minded, like Elsevier, which is probably the worst of the big ones. And those big commercial interests saw this as a massive money-making opportunity, and it was. Uh, I think the number three internet-based commercial enterprise is Elsevier, uh, right after China Mobile. Um, so that's one set of considerations. A second set of considerations is it's the right thing to do. And Harvard has the potential to perhaps make some decisions a little bit more autonomously than the University of Kansas might. It would be suicide for us to say, oh, let's stop subscribing to Elsevier journals just because we don't like them. Okay, our colleagues would literally come and cut our heads off. But we can vote with our editorships, we can vote with our reviews, we can vote with our citations, so, for example, I don't do editorships for big commercial journals. For example, if Elsevier journals ask me to review a paper, I write them a very polite couple of sentences saying, it's a very interesting paper, I'd love to review it, but I won't review it for an Elsevier journal. And we can also vote by, by where we send our papers and where we, um, where we do our citations. If I have two papers that I could cite for the same point, and one of them is in an open access journal, I should cite that one. If only because more people who read my paper can follow up on the evidence that I cited. And, sorry, and just by doing that, you got that increase that we saw in that graph. 
No, that increase in that graph had to do with making the public statement that the University of Kansas is an open access institution, okay? And essentially, immediately, our, our institutional repository saw much greater attention. It sounds like the, uh, the revolution is needed in, in academic institutions about publishing um, and moving to the open access. But be that it is, as it may, Sambia is in the process of challenging this journal. We have a Bothelia, which is since 1925, I think. And given that Sambia's mandate has changed to biodiversity, we're launching the African Biodiversity and Conservation Journal. So the scope is extended, including policy matters and geographically all of Africa. And we grappled with the issue about what's the funding model mm -hmm. for this journal. Because on the one hand, if, if, if you're going to start charging for access, that would that fund the operations. Or you could charge the, um, the, 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 the authors. The authors, yes. Um, or you could have a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, but Sandra adopted the principle of free and open access. And the bottom line is that there's a cost involved. Of course. In managing and distributing the journal. And it, it ends up how you place or how you displace that cost. Yes. So, I mean, the model that we chose is partly subsidized, uh, partly um, so, uh, page fee based for, for yeah. authors who are receiving grants, and open access for publication. I mean, open access, all but, but open free publication for emerging scientists in the field. And that's the model we chose. But I, I do think, you know, it's a bit of a difficult issue when the bottom line is how do you pay? Uh, meat and potatoes, those are the meat and potatoes issues. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, I'm very conscious of it because with two other professors, I run Biodiversity Informatics, which is a tiny volume journal, but the person who's doing the copy editing is me. So there the cost is you know three or four hours in my evenings. Um, there's a very interesting point to consider. 20, 30 years ago, all of these journals were print journals. And so you had very real costs. After you've set type, you had very real costs of printing it, binding it, and shipping it. In the past 20 years, most journals have gone at least partly, if not completely, electronic. And so they're not printing, they're not binding, and they're not shipping, which is a big part of the actual cost. And yet the prices have still gone up. So what also went up is the profit margin. So that, that's just a comment. No, a but good. very conscious of, of the real costs that are involved, essentially in going from the manuscript that an author submits to you to the final PDF. And there, there's another series of minefields. If we do reader pays, the subscription model, then we exclude a lot of readers. If we say, OK, author pays, the beauty of that is that we open the paper to all of the readers around the world at any institution that would have internet access. Great. But we're in a world in which more and more scholarship is coming from more and more developing countries. It's a flattening scientific world. And in that sense, what we've done by going to the author pays model is we've said, OK, anybody can read, but it's a closed access world for writers. OK, we have literally erected impediments for Unresourced writers. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, the thousand dollars, I think plus biology is twenty seven hundred dollars for the author charges, uh, and plus one is thirteen hundred, twelve hundred, something like that. In some cases that's several months of salary. Right? So what we don't want to do is just move our impediment back from readers to writers. So what really has to do, what we have to do is find some subsidy in the most base type of subsidy. We could have advertisements. That's okay with me. We still get the communication across. 
the other sorts of subsidy are institutional subsidies. So Sanbi chips in. You're not recovering, you're not making money off of those author charges. It's called knowledge dissemination within the land. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's a different currency where you're getting information out about African and South African biodiversity. And that's a currency that is important to you. So it's a very tough road to ride, but there's a really interesting thing about this. Right now, I can't say to my colleagues at the University of Kansas, give up your Wiley subscription. But as we move, and it'll take 10 or 20 years, as we move from a reader pays world to an open access world, remember there were four and a half million dollars every year just from the University of Kansas. And that same quantity from all of our peer institutions around the world, and a slightly lower quantity from institutions that are more you know, teaching colleges and less research institutions, and probably more from in some institutions that have the, the premier level access. So you've got billions of dollars that are being spent on the scientific literature, but they're flowing right out of academia and into commercial pockets. So the real interesting strategy is how to take even a tenth of that money and harness it for academic publishing, for subsidizing something like Sandby's journals, instead of sending it to Elsevier. So the money is there, and we're throwing it away every year because we sold our souls to the devil. And what we have to do is think very strategically right now about how we make this transition from a reader pays world to an open access world and keep some of that money for academic publishing. The money exists. I don't know who pays for Sanby's journal access, but I assume that you can get to Springer journals. Who, who pays for that? Sanby? Yeah, it's a budget line. Do you have any idea how much it is? He does, Sanby. How much do you pay? No, he's not even with a credit card. Sorry. Just a note. You there you go. I mean, you have the, the luxury of being focused on organismal biology and not having to deal with, you know, particle physics. Two years ago, Sammy subscription was a million. Uh -huh. Just close to a million. And we took a ruthless exercise of cutting up the number of journals and having scientists argue them back in. Yeah. And suddenly it came down to half. And the other issue I'm ask is that, just a dumb the discussion is that hmm, Oxford Publishing has got two models. One is the paid access, the other one is the open access. But it says that for open access, the author must pay. Yes. yes. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how many authors actually take up the challenges of paying so that they can have open access. It's quite common. It is quite common because, and you can see it very easily, just go to the, you know, one of those journal pages and they'll have like a smile or something like that next to the ones that the author paid to make open access. And the reasons why the authors do that is that they know that that'll up the citation rates. Uh, but I've seen open access fees in closed access journals. So these are called hybrid journals. Uh, I've seen the open access fees in hybrid journals as high as $3,000 for one paper. So they're making yet another ton of money off of this game. The journals, the publishers are smart. And they're going to play this game for every penny they can. It's very, very clear. Um, Nature even came up with a concept that was amazing. You can rent a paper. And so you see a paper that you're interested in, published in Nature, and you pay, I think it was like $48 for a, for a moderate-sized paper in Nature. And for 24 hours, you can read it. And then after 24 hours, the file decomposes. So we just clean dumps. Exactly. So it's a complex landscape, without a doubt. Other questions around the table? Jean? Yes. Hold on.
Yeah, it is about uh, the journals where we can publish data, like on biodiversity. Uh, which ones are the best uh, to choose? Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, there is uh, cost. Uh, for some, we have, the authors have to pay a lot of money. <laughs> Yes, and uh, others may accept, but are they known or serious? Yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a very large and complex question. My own personal opinion as a researcher is publish the paper where it will reach the appropriate audience, keeping in mind considerations of access. That's a very general answer. If you are looking to show off a new technique or a brand new result, you may be able to publish it in the best of journals. And that brings benefits in terms of funding for your research and maybe salary raises and things like that. But oftentimes we have the choice between a journal that is right on versus a journal that's not quite on but maybe is easier. And my, in general, my feeling is you should try to reach the correct audience. Because if, you're, if your publications aren't getting to the people who should read them, it's basically an expensive hobby. It's not a very useful exercise. Um, but you know, you can, we, we have this, this argument every single time my colleagues and I are publishing a paper of, okay, where do we send it? We can probably aim low and it gets accepted right away. We can aim too high and it'll get a no and a no and a no. Or we can aim just right and maybe get some tough reviews and maybe have to revise it two or three times, but it eventually gets accepted. But I think every decision, every one of those decisions is a unique case. It depends on the content of the paper. It depends on the, the reason that the paper was written. What were you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to communicate? So it, it's a very, very complex question, I think. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say it's an interesting question. Excuse me, Philemon. Because I think what Tan is talking about is some revolutionary changes in that world of publishing. Whereas we, yeah, sometimes are just at the point of asking the question, which is the best 